folks. You know, a very welcome to our service this morning. <coughs> and also say a word of welcome to those people who are joining us from home. We hope that you enjoy your time of fellowship with us this morning. And indeed, it's always a pleasure to have the Reverend Philip uh, back to conduct the service this morning. And we will also be having uh, communion as well. As usual, you're all more than welcome to join us for a cup of tea and coffee and time of fellowship in the hall afterwards. So please don't be in a rush away. Just a few announcements. Uh, on Thursday at 8 o'clock, the prayer union will continue to meet in the hall and everyone will be welcome to join them on Thursday at 8. Then next Sunday morning, worship will be here as usual at 10.30 and Mr. Andre Topley will be along to take the service next week. Then next Sunday evening, uh, it starts off the Apollod services over in Moira and there is leaflets available in the porch with all the details uh, for, for all those services that we've been through <coughs> until the end of August. And next Sunday evening, uh, it will be at 9 o'clock, the speaker will be the Reverend David Mullen and special music will be from Mrs. Melanie Topley. So that's next Sunday evening at 9 o'clock in Moira and everyone will be welcome to that. So these are all the announcements <coughs> you might remember in prayer. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the announcements. It's, it's great to be with you back here to, to worship <coughs> all together in this uh, community <coughs> service. Uh, one more thing by way of announcement. Uh, following uh, this Sunday, we will be off on, on holiday for four weeks, and we'll be back uh, Monday the 24th of July, and the Reverend Ken Lindsay will be covering uh, during that time. Let's stand and sing together, crying him with many crimes.
let us, the King of Kings. This morning we gather in wonder and awe, comprehensible love, that you sit upon the throne, entered our world as a weak and lowly sacrificial lamb to give his life might receive forgiveness, acceptance and eternal life. We thank you for the message of your gospel, for how beautiful this morning we stand not on our own goodness, claiming no merit of our own. We stand only on your goodness, relying on We thank you that there is infinite redemption, life, forgiveness as your family. We are mindful of, of, of those of our brothers and sisters unable to be here for it's due to ill health. We think of those in hospital at the minute. We pray for your healing hand upon them, for those never ending peace. Lord, we think of uh, situations around the world where there is conflict. We think of the, the situation in, in Ukraine continually and and just pray for, for, for peace in that land and, and for all world leaders to, to work together for, for peace there. We just ask that the, the suffering of, of those people uh, would cease, that they would have freedom in their own country again, free from invaders. We think of places where there is famine and, and food shortages and that, that, are, that are being heightened at the minute due to circumstances. We, we, we pray that the food would reach all who need it and, and you would guide us, your church, uh, to be your, your hands and your feet, to bring your love in, in, in practical ways uh, to everybody who, who is in need. Lord, as we worship you this morning, as we come later in the service around your table, we ask that you would meet us in a special, life-transforming way that you would enrich our walk with you, that you would bring us closer to you and transform us more and more into your likeness, that your glory might radiate from us to everyone we meet. And now we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now receive our offering for God's word. Thank mm -hmm. you.
We're reading this morning from Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. These are the words of Jesus. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, (coughs) and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Let's pray before we look at this together. Lord, thank you that your word is is powerful, that it is living, true and clear. We ask that you just speak from this passage into our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Judge not that you be not judged. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, told a very candid and honest story about an incident from his life in which he fell short of these words of Jesus Christ. There was a certain man converted through his ministry, whom he judged to be extremely miserly and covetous. One day when this man gave only a small gift to a worthy charity, Wesley openly criticised him as he thought it was well less than what he could afford. After the incident, the man came up to Wesley privately and told him that he'd been living on parsnips and water for a number of weeks. He explained that before his conversion, he had run up a a lot of debts through, through wanton and reckless living. And now he was doing his best to pay his creditors back as quickly as possible. He said this to Wesley, Christ has made me an honest man. And so with all these debts to pay, I can only give a few offerings above my time. I must settle with my worldly neighbours and show them the gr- what the grace of God can do in the heart of a dishonest man. Hearing this, Wesley felt ashamed and immediately asked the man for his forgiveness. This story demonstrates to us why we shouldn't sit in judgment over others. We shouldn't do so because we are not God. We don't see the motives of people's hearts. We're unaware of the experiences, influences and hurts that have shaped them. We don't know how far they've come, how hard they're trying and what pressure they're under. And thus we've no idea how we would fare if we were in their shoes. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Romans 14. Who are you to judge the servant of another? It's before his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord will uphold him. Through this passage, Jesus is telling us what Wesley discovered. In the moment the man he wrongly accused opened his heart to him. No matter what heights you've reached in your walk with God, you do not sit with him above his law as his fellow judge over your fellow man. Rather, you're called to humble yourself before him as a doer of his law. We're called to walk with those who are weak, lowly and struggling, seeing ourselves as no different from them, having no other thoughts toward them, then what can I do to show them love? In 
fulfillment of the law that says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and your neighbour as yourself. As we look at these words of Jesus, we will see the measure we are to use when forming opinions about others and deciding how to relate to them, and what we must do to receive that measure. So what's the measure we are to use when forming opinions about people and deciding how to relate to them? Jesus' words of warning in, in verse 2 direct us toward it. With the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The point Jesus is trying to get across is this. Don't see yourself as God. Instead, see others through, through God's eye of mercy and grace. The measure we are to use when forming opinions about those we encounter and deciding how to relate to them is the full measure of God's mercy and grace that he poured out for everyone in his Son, Jesus Christ. In this passage, Jesus isn't telling us to cast aside all discernment about who we entrust ourselves to and partner with. Rather, he's saying, no matter what you discern, never look at another human being made in God's image without your heart overflowing with compassion and empathy toward them. With regard to the people you encounter every day, from those you know very well to those you've never met before, are you looking for little shoots of goodness that you can bless and affirm into full, full bloom? Or are you looking for, for weeds that you can pull out harshly on the basis of which you can write them off? What is the current default setting of your heart? Is it to find fault and condemn? Or is it to find good and commend? If you're anything like me, at times you've fallen into the trap of looking at the world around you with a judgmental spirit that assumes the worst of people rather than the best. We can reason to ourselves that someone deserves to be taken down a peg or two and put in their place. And I'm just the person to do it. I need to make sure that everybody else sees with me what that person is really like. But who are we to arbitrate over the lives of others in that way? We don't see the motives of their heart. We don't know their full story. They are God's servants for him to deal with as he pleases. And he deals with them in his mercy that upholds him. When the measure we use to evaluate others is the full measure of, of mercy and grace God gave us in Jesus Christ, nothing pleases us more than to see them prosper. Whatever deficiencies and shortcomings they might have. Because we're all acutely aware that we have just as many, if not more. But is it practically possible for us to see past people's faults and to desire the very best for them? from a heart that is nothing but love, affection, and goodwill toward them. God is simply asking us to do for others by his grace what we do naturally for ourselves. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis put it like this. I used to think this is a silly, straw-splitting distinction. How could you hate what a man did, and not hate the man. But years later, it occurred to me that 
there was one man to whom I had been doing this for for my entire life, namely myself. However much I might dislike my own cowardice, conceit and greed. I went on loving myself, wanting the very best for myself. There had never been the slightest difficulty about it. Jesus promised to us, as we relate to the world around us, from the infinite measure of, of mercy and, and grace that, that is in him, it is this. God's blessing and favour will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, running over, put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. How do we receive this infinite measure of divine mercy and grace? Which enables us to let God be God and to get on with our business of loving God with all our heart and our neighbour as ourselves. We receive this measure by removing the, the beam of pride and self-righteousness from our eye through confessing our sin in, in brokenness and contrition at the foot of his cross. This beam of pride and self-righteousness is, is dealt with the moment we come to faith in Christ, but it can reappear time and time again in our Christian lives. And we are always the very last person to see it. This is something I discovered as a young Christian. When I was in a small Bible study group with friends, there was a very shy girl who never spoke. After about 45 minutes into the fifth meeting, she finally built up the, the, the courage to, to say something. I was next to speak. These were my words. No, 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 that's, that's wrong. That's not the way it is. This is the way it is. Everybody could see that what I did was out of line apart from me. I thought nothing of it and continued as if all was well with the world. Later that night her, her friend phoned me and explained to me in, in love and gentleness how, how that girl was hurt by my comments. I was cut to the bone. With the plaque out of my eye I could see clearly what an idiot I was. I repented before God and, and, and rang her up. To apologize. In this place of brokenness at the foot of the cross, where alone we are healed and made clean and restored by the grace of God, we become people who can correct others in love, who in a spirit of humility, gentleness and, and overflowing com compassion can help them with the speck that is in their eye. My dear brother, my dear sister, I understand how much that little speck is, is hurting and, and hindering you. I know something of the, the shame, regret and, and awkwardness you must feel. I used to have a, a giant plank in my eye. I messed up in ways far greater than you could ever do or, or ever imagine. Let me walk with you pray for you, and be there unconditionally for you. Let me lead you back to our Saviour, who has nothing but mercy and grace for you, who will make you whole and set you free, just like he's done with me time and time again. The good news for fumbling forgetful people like you and me. The good news which we remember and celebrate and partake of at this table is that for, for people like us who make the same mistake time and time and time again is that we never come to the foot of the cross in brokenness and hear these words sorry that's one time too many. 
Each time we will be made whole and set on our feet again. As God's mercy and grace for us in Christ will always triumph over the judgment we deserve and the mess we've made. Restoring us back into to, to vessels through which God's saving, redeeming love is poured out into the world in a life-transforming way. A few years ago, I read a biography about a, a man called George Muller. God used mightily in the, the 19th century to establish a number of orphanages for, for homeless children in the Bristol area. There was one unruly boy under his care who made life unbearable and intolerable for everyone who was trying to, to help him. No matter what Muller did to try and turn this boy back to, to the right track, his, his behaviour got worse and worse. It came to the point where for the safety and good of, of the other children in his care, Muller had no choice but to send him away. Before he did, however, he had the, the boy brought into his office for him to lay his hand on his head to, to pray for him. The boy opened his eyes, expecting to see anger and hatred on the face of, of this man he had tormented so much. Instead, he saw tears streaming down his cheeks. He was so impacted by, by God's love in that moment that he saw in, in the face of this man that he gave his life to Jesus Christ and went on to become a minister. At times, we reach a point with certain people where there's nothing left for us to say or to do. All that remains is to commit them to the Lord in prayer and to keep praying for them with tears. God's mercy freely given us through Jesus Christ is so powerful that it triumphs over judgment, carnage and decay in the lives of those we encounter. Even in that moment, when we, in our weakness and helplessness, can do nothing more for them. Let go of all the things you hold to and rely on in this world for confidence and security. Meet Jesus again at the foot of his cross filled to overflowing with his mercy and his grace. Look at his world through it. You will bring blessing, freedom and life as opposed to judgment, condemnation and death to everyone you encounter. As you give, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, running over, placed into your lap, for with the measure you use, <coughs> it will be measured to you. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, that it is living and true, that it is filled to overflowing with grace and mercy towards sinful people like us who, who mess up and, and make the same mistakes time and time again. We thank you that you love us, that at this table we will shortly come to you, we are reminded of the infinite depths of your love that is for us. Lord, may we see the world through your grace, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to the table, let's sing our third hymn, O Thou Who Camest From Above, number 525. <laughs>
Let us pray before we come to the Lord's table. Lord, we thank you that you came from above, <coughs> that you entered our world humble and lowly, not to condemn, but to pay the price that we deserve so that we might be free from condemnation. At this table we remember that you entered our world not to judge, but to bring about redemption and set us free. We thank you that here there is, there is abundant grace for sinners like us. Lord, we pray that this morning you would feed our souls afresh. As we come to this, your table, not as those who are perfect, not depending on our griefs, but as those who are flawed and full of faults, clinging only to your goodness, clinging only to your salvation, depending only not on what we do, but on what you have done for us. You are our goodness, our salvation, and our peace. Assured of that, we come to your table in joy to partake afresh of what you have done for us. Amen. For I receive from the Lord Jesus what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until Draw near in faith.
Lord, we thank you that this table you have fed and nourished our souls with your grace. Send us forth to see this world through it and to pour your love out on everyone we meet. In Jesus' name. Amen. saying the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all. Amen.